Hello and welcome to D2C Podcast. I'm Eric Dick. Today, we're digging into our unreleased content archive to deliver one of the most relevant and powerful talks from our very first C-Suite Mastermind back in September 2022 from Sean Frank, CEO of Ridge Wallet. His key message to brands then is even more relevant now. Find a way to survive and focus on building a legacy brand with a high quality product and unforgettable experience. Ridge's goal is to become the American Mont Blanc crossed with Yeti with a nice glass of Hennessy. This podcast goes a mile a minute and covers uh, Sean's thoughts on venture versus bootstrapping, the toxicity and power of Twitch, owning your audience's affinity with content marketing partnerships and more, as well as his neat concept of 30-day product-specific funnel drains and so much more. On with the show. Hope you love it. If I was doing less than $50 million a year, I would exclusively focus on content creation. And everyone's talking about that, right? But like, here's a tactical reason why. Instagram is going to take away ad space from Reels to promote organic content in Reels because they see TikTok as an existential threat, right? So for the first time since Obama, we can get free distribution from these players. Creator-led businesses are going to win the next five to 10 years. Go 100% in on organic content because uh, it's a gift that's only going to be here for a little bit of time. Creative minds, math-obsessed media buyers. To ship more winning ads, you need both worlds working together. Introducing Thumbstop, the weekly newsletter by Motion that covers the art and the science of creating winning meta, TikTok, and YouTube ads. Every Sunday, you'll learn about the science. Think about CAC and contribution margin spreadsheet tutorials, advanced ad analysis techniques, and interviews with elite media buyers. You'll build your analytical skills every week. The art. Creative cheat codes, winning TikTok ad formats, interviews with creative directors. You'll get practical ideas to ship winning ads faster and new ways to fix the brand performance divide. Subscribe at motionapp.com forward slash thumbstop. When you were preparing, I know you did do a lot. You actually, you, when I asked you to come, you're like, I'm coming, but I'm not going to prepare, which is how you roll. But just, I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, from what do you think is one of the most important things you could be telling this audience today? Yeah, survive. I think it's a lot of brand owners out here. Uh, that's been my advice for like three years and people thought I was crazy. Uh, I've just been talking about like, oh no, like it's going to get really hard to run a brand. Uh, and then it got really hard to run a brand. And I know a lot of brands that didn't survive, if you're in this room, You've, you've made it through some sort of great filter. There's going to be more great filters ahead of you. I think a lot of people are looking for funding. Uh, close it sooner rather than later. Uh, funding's going to get harder and harder to get because money's getting more expensive. Um, you know, the, the Fed raised rates and they're like, yeah, we're going to do it three more times before the end of the year, which just means, you know, people talk about dry, dry powder. I got, got a text from I was sitting over there talking about, oh, venture capital has so much dry powder right now. Uh, Last week, I spoke at a VC conference, and they're like, the, the common thread was that they're not allowed to ask their LPs for money right now. Like, it's disrespectful to ask your LPs for money in a down market, right? You know, we can go into like how capital calls really work, right? Uh, you know, you think you hear, you know, SoftBank raise all this money or whatever. Uh, they don't, it's not in their bank account. They have to actually go out there and request that money. And... The LPs did commit that money to them, right? There's a contract saying that they'll give them that money, but they really don't want to uh, have to sell assets in a down market. So there's a lot less capital than people think, and it's getting more and more expensive. So going to be a hard six to 12 months in that space. So number one rule, survive. What is Ridge Wallet doing to survive? Well, you're beyond surviving at this point, but what is Ridge Wallet doing to, to prepare for this, this the next period. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was a theory that for the past 10 years that brands could grow like software companies, right? Like that was the whole idea is that you could be a Allbirds or Wilby Parker and you can raise money and like, oh, I'm going to build, you know, the Figma of shoes or whatever, right? Uh, that's proven to be false. Like, you know, uh, if, if you have my Twitter feed pulled up, I wrote this whole thing about this, but uh, the most valuable brand single brand ever is Hermes, right? They're uh, 185 years old, right? 
they did not raise venture capital and fucking scale to $135 billion. Uh, or like the best success story, uh, Canadian favorite Lululemon, uh, it's going on like 30 years old, right? They're only worth $45 billion. So half of what Figma just got bought for, that's 25 years of fucking effort to build Lululemon. So venture scale outcomes just aren't possible in the brand space. I think that's been proven. You can still sell your business for a billion dollars. But fucking, you know, you could be Hero Cosmetics. You could sell for $680 million. That's, that's an amazing outcome. If you don't raise money, you're way richer than some guy who raised money, right? Um, but you're not going to be able to, you know, there's no shortcuts to that, right? It's not a 10 year thing, it's not a 20 year thing even. So it's gonna take a long time. Nice. What, so with the phase of growth that you're at now, we were talking with Tony about saturation. Where are, what did you think of that talk also? Like in terms of, is, is it similar to how you guys think about, about saturating audiences? Uh, no, I think we have a different philosophy there. Um, you know, we'll, we'll do well over $100 million this year, right? We're not quite at 250, but that's what we're pushing for. Um, that's a ton of wallets, right? Our wallets are like 100 bucks, 150 bucks, so it's a ton of fucking sales. And people are always just like, oh, how big is the wallet market, right? And, you know, if you look at all small other goods, right, that's gonna include purses or whatever else, the TAM's like $100 billion. It's an insane amount of wallets being sold every year. And we do a lot of surveys with Google or whatever else, and most men don't buy their own wallet. Most men haven't bought a wallet in five or seven years. So we're not close to saturation. Like we're still like trying to build that like brand DNA. And really, when like you know, we're just not geo focused at all, right? I think what Tony's doing in Vancouver uh, is a really beautiful strategy. When uh, the, the current CEO of Hermes took over. He's like, give me a list of every city a store's in. Don't give me the address. I'm going to go find it. Because he's like, I'm going to be able to sense by the neighborhood where it is, right? That's like, you know, you know this, this uh, real world focus approach. I think Tony's doing that in, in Vancouver. Uh, if we're going to do saturation, it's going to be through audience, right? Like I said, we're going to sponsor every car channel on YouTube. Anyone who is into the automotive space uh, knows about a company we're partners with called Hennessy, so we're gonna go after that aggressively, or the tech space. And what you end up finding is that like, the internet's way more siloed than the rest of the world, right? We can sponsor two content creators who hate each other, right? But their audience has no idea we're sponsoring the other side of that, so. Where did the Hennessy brand partnership come from? Is that from deep research on people who love Hennessy, love Ridge? No, I was just a big fan. Uh, so if you guys, if you, so there's a company called Hennessy Performance. They're based in Texas. If you guys like hypercars, there's a company called Koenigsegg. They're based in uh, in Sweden. They're they're trying to make the fastest car, right? Bugatti is another one in France trying to make the fastest car. Hennessy's the American version of that. They make a hypercar. It sells for like five million dollars. I've been a big fan for a long time. I just hit them up and they said, "Cool, come fly down to the factory." And we hung out and. Uh, which will, any, any of those prestigious brands, like they're family businesses, they don't really know how to survive in the digital age, so there's just a lot of good synergy there, and uh, it's been an awesome partnership. So we're giving away one of their trucks right now. That's a cool thing we're doing. Very cool, and is that, that's funny, I, I followed the, the, diesel, uh, the Diesel Brothers for a long time, and they, they, they did so well with their giveaway model of giving away this truck. How, how's the giveaway model working so far? Yeah, you know, uh, we definitely don't want to be a giveaway company. I met one of those guys just at a dinner and he told me I should do it. So I trusted him and I did it. Is it Van? Uh, yeah, a mustache? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, Out of Way Sox was just talking about creating a summer event, right? So we, in, in 2021, we decided, like, let's see if we can make our own events, right? So, like, uh, there's a guy, Taylor Holiday, on Twitter. You should talk to him and, and just look into his research, but there's a thing called the four peak strategy, right? And we both kind of came up with uh, that at the same time, I think. So in March, we do an anniversary sale, right? And then we have Father's Day is a huge event for us. Those are like multi eight figure months. And then in Q4, we have, you know, Christmas shopping, holiday shopping, whatever. We have nothing in the summer. So from like July to October, we didn't really have a reason to 
you know, make a customer purchase, right? And if you look at like buying cycles or whatever, your, your, your post-purchase survey, like people stay in your funnel for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. So we wanted to create basically, you know, every 90 days a reason to flush the funnel out. And last year we gave away a truck, this year we're giving away a Bronco, and like we're tying together partnerships. I think next year we have something with Ford lined up, which would be really cool. Uh, like, you know, we'll do something with, uh, you know, a bunch of race car drivers, it'll be a really cool, fun thing we do. But creating a, you know, your own little holidays and like a reason for your customers to purchase, we found a lot of success with that. And then we've moved even more drastically that like if you're in our funnel for over 60 days, right, uh, we have like, you know, once a month, uh, we call them funnel drains. So if we have like a $200 Black Damascus wallet, if you're in our funnel for 60 days, you know, make a purchase, you get an offer to buy that at like an extreme discount just because. We want to flush you out and get, get new people in. Oh, that's interesting. Um, have you ever advertised on Twitch? Yeah, we've, we've, we have done some Twitch stuff. Uh, we got into the whole influencer space just because I'm, I was a fan. So the Hennessy thing, sponsoring YouTubers. I was, Cars in general? Like the whole car affiliation, is that something you brought to the table? Uh, yeah, I mean, car, cars are definitely cool, but I was just a really big fan of Hennessy and yeah. what they were building specifically. Um, but yeah, going back to Twitch, yeah, we, we sponsored a lot of people on Twitch. I think Twitch is a super toxic platform now. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, people are laughing. If, if, if you know about Twitch... Uh, Dr. Demento, what's his name? Well, uh, Dr. Disrespect, but Disrespect, he, he, yeah. Yeah, he went to YouTube, so he's, okay. he's good. No, um, but yeah, like, Twitch is a, like an ecosystem. We were really early in sponsoring there. But no, they let gambling happen on the platform. Like, you can just straight up watch people pr like play roulette and like crypto gambling. And like, it's just it's like... A company like Stake is spending, you know, really five hundred thousand dollars per streaming hour to sponsor somebody, and it's just it's not healthy for the ecosystem. So we don't really do a lot of stuff there anymore. What would it take? You're you're you're, you're over a hundred million. The stretch goal is two hundred and fifty. Like in a in a perfect world, like what would it take for you to get to that next level this year, or or in, in your next time frame, kind of thing? Just bigger, bigger partnerships, kind of thing. More ad spend. What would it take? Yeah. So. The biggest shift, and maybe this is some good advice for people in the room, is, is we're really trying to slow down. Every bad thing that's happened in our business has happened when we try to grow more than 50% every year. So we've had a couple of years we've doubled, and it's a disaster, right? Like, you know, uh, someone said the only thing that can kill your business is debt, uh, and that's 100% correct, right? Like, also speed just makes that knife on the steering wheel a lot more deadly, right? Um, you know, we, we've had instances where like, if, you're gr if you do accrual accounting and you're growing 100% year over year, you, you have a tax bill because you can't write off your inventory, but you have to buy inventory to keep growing. And as creative as you get with financing there, you're gonna have to take on debt to do that. It's just a very uh, disastrous place to be. Um, you know, I know a brand, uh, they've changed hand a couple times. They make silicone rings. They were really fast growing. They had this massive PO from Target. Uh, it was like you know five, six million or whatever. And they're like, oh cool, we'll just buy the inventory on American Express. Like we don't need a, we don't need debt or whatever else. We'll just buy it on American Express. They missed their delivery date. Target cancels the PO. Target's like, hey, we don't want that anymore. We're not going to pay you. The company was distressed at that point. They had to sell for pennies on the dollar, and uh, it ruined what, what they were building. So uh, slowing down, man. I guess to the original question, what does it take to get to two fifty? I'm not going to aggressively pursue that goal. What I'm going to aggressively pursue is like building like a true brand. When I think about what Ridge is going to be, I'm trying to build the American Mont Blanc. So like Mont Blanc's been around for 200 years. They make the pen every lawyer uses. Uh, they're owned by a company called Richmont. They're like a super legacy brand, but you know they're doing 500 million dollars a year. Or Victorinox, right? Like the Swiss Army knife. They're uh, a nonprofit in Switzerland. They're doing 500 million dollars a year. It just takes a long time to get to that scale, and it, like. Once you get over 100 million, it's just all about like nailing product expansion. You can hack your way. I, I posted on Twitter, uh, brand doesn't matter until you're doing 50 million a year. It doesn't matter at all. If you're doing under 50 million dollars a year, uh, you're like, oh, I have to pick my customers or my community. It's like it's really just a fleeting moment in time. Like, you know, your social following, whatever else, you're one move away from them totally like suppressing your reach. So just do what it takes to get as big as possible so you can start thinking about brand. You can start thinking about product development, right? Um, 
Yeah. What, what, what are you guys thinking about product development? Have you already released other products at Ridge? No, in about two weeks, you guys are starting to see a lot more stuff come from us. Uh, yeah, so like I look up to Yeti. Yeti's the best success story of the past probably 15 years. Publicly traded, worth four and a half billion dollars. Never took VC money, all private equity along the way. Uh, once again, a category nobody cared about. Nobody cared about water bottles. They're like, you're gonna do fucking what in this space, or coolers? And they built you know, a luxury item uh, for a class of people who typically don't get marketed to for luxury items, right? Uh, the, most, the best selling car in America is the Ford F-150. It starts at $75,000, right? So there's a bunch of guys out there who are fishing and hunting and spending a fuck ton of money on their hobbies that don't get catered to for the luxury space. Yeti was able to take advantage of that um, and build this massive brand. So we're gonna take the same sort of Yeti playbook and just put it across the same items Mont Blanc makes. So that's, that's really the pitch. So pen. Yeah, we, we do sell some pens. Okay. Uh, the big success is we sell a key organizer. Super boring. A lot of people in the room have no idea what I'm talking about. There's a company called Orbit Key based in Australia. Uh, and it's like a thing for your, like your house keys or whatever. We launched it, and that month became the best-selling key organizer on Earth. So like Orbit Key is doing maybe a million a month or whatever, and we immediately uh, beat them. So. Just from your, similar to what Rob was saying to your existing customer base? Yeah, yeah, just selling to our customer base, and then, you know, we're just way better acquisition marketing than somebody like an Orbit Key was, is ever going to be, yeah. right? Yeah. What's that? Yeah, so, uh, pre-COVID, we were on pace, so like, the year of 2020, we were, we were going to do $50 million that year. And then COVID hit, and some people had amazing years, some people had horrible years. It just depends on what industry you're in. We, we ended like, we had like a pretty okay time, right? Uh, but really, what happened to take us from that 50 to 100 was just a basic. We had to rethink every piece of our business that like we, like, we made, we made way, way too many assumptions. Like when you're building your company and you're doing you know, $20 million, you've been doing it for like two or three years or five years or whatever, you have so many assumptions about your business that are totally wrong. Like here, here's a good example. We increased conversion rates across the site by 25% uh, because our drop down menu used to say like, it'd be say wallets and you'd click on it and it would say carbon fiber, burnt titanium, whatever. No one makes a wallet purchase like that. Like we just, we were so used to talking about our items like that where it was like, oh yeah, those are the different types of wallets. But a normal guy has never made that choice when making a wallet purchase. So we had to like rebuild that up, right? And like also like what we stood for. We we're like, oh yeah, we're just gonna sell wallets to guys. We're like, no, no, we're actually trying to sell carbon fiber to guys. Like we're trying to become a material company. So uh, what they let us to do is just charge way more. Uh, I always go back to charging more. The biggest driver of growth, I think, is like, you know, our AOV used to be $65, and now it's $150. Like, our average first time customer is spending north of $130, north of $140. And it's because we've been able to rethink what we're doing and just charge more for it, like repackage it. So that's, that's, that's the best growth we've found. To push towards that, that luxury category a little yes. bit more. Yeah. That's a better way to say Anchor it. Anchor yeah. higher, yeah. Yeah, you know, we're in the process of what I call professionalizing. Like, this is our first year we're gonna have audited financials. So like, we, we were running the business like it was a family run business. We basically still do. Uh, but it was the shift towards like, no, we're gonna hire people who are experts. We're gonna spend a fuck ton of money on accountants and lawyers and getting all that stuff set up. Um, so yeah, man, that's, that's basically been it. Or are you 
Yeah, so we, we basically build all our products ourselves. We've made a couple acquisitions of like other companies. Uh, so some guy was talking about content and commerce coming together earlier. So I bought a website called everydaycarry.com. Uh, it's like a men's gear website. I was talking to Uncrate, I was talking to Cool Material. I ended up buying this one because frankly it was the cheapest one. Uh, and you know, we're using, so the way those websites work, right, it has like a million dollars a year in affiliate revenue. So I can see what everyone's buying on Amazon through that website, right? So I can see, okay, what's the most popular knife or whatever else, and what does the Ridge version of that look like? Um, I was gonna buy a couple more brands, but I'm honestly waiting for like the floor to fall out. I think there's a lot of sharks circling right now. Got a friend, Roman, and he's like, yeah, I'm trying to buy companies for 30 cents on the dollar for inventory value because there's just no buyers of unprofitable e-commerce companies, right? It used to be the aggregators, right? But the aggregators actually lost a ton of money. They're, they're, they're having hard times on themselves. So there's like a whole category of brand that's been created. Hopefully nobody in this room. There's been a whole category of brands created over the past five, 10 years that like get to five, seven, 10 million. They're not profitable. No one really wants that business. Uh, so I was looking to buy some of those, um, but you know, a lot of headaches. I've just been building a lot of our own products. We have watches coming out of jewelry line, knives, that type of stuff. Do you think just because of the category of play that, like, your new product innovation pipeline is, like, breakable, like, have not yet conversations? Yeah, dude, we've had, like, the shittiest lifetime value, right? When you sell a wallet that's guaranteed for life, like, and you only sell wallets, not a lot of guys are buying more than one. But our common thread we've been able to tie together is, uh, you know, over 50% of our purchases are buying, our customers are buying the carbon fiber wallet. And if you check out our website, you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, but that's like a $150 purchase. It's the same function as the $90 wallet. So when we talk to our customers, like, hey, why are you spending twice as much to buy this one? They're like, oh, we like it. We think carbon fiber is cool. And we're like, oh, fuck, we should just make way more stuff out of carbon fiber, right? So we made a pen out of carbon fiber, made that key organizer, and now customers are buying a full set of stuff to match. And that's one reason we bought everydaycarry.com is because there's, I think it gets like 500,000 visits a month or something, and every one of those guys, we can be like, yeah, here's all the stuff, and it matches, you should buy this, so. Uh, yeah, nailing the, the, the product development is the most crucial piece for any brand going from 100 to a billion. Like you can force $100 million off of one SKU, one category, like, uh, but if you really wanna be a billion dollar lifestyle brand or whatever, every single one of them has a second anchor point, right? Like, Yeah, what really made me start believing that VC just doesn't work in our space, it, or it really, if you want to get to 50 million or, a hun, or sorry, 50 billion or 100 billion, like true like icon status brands, like private equity doesn't really work either because, you know, Hermes, none of us can buy a Birkin. Like, we cannot go to the store and buy one. They'll tell us they don't have them. Even if they're in the back, like, they'll say no. And that's a $20,000 bag, right? So like, their strategy is to deny a $20,000 sale. That's a fuck ton of revenue. A private equity guard would be like, let's make more of these things. People want them, right? But uh, their ability to like, have that restraint is, it's, it's a multi-generational outlook for a business, right? Like, it's the reason why LVMH can be 400, same market cap as Walmart. Um, so yeah, Hermes, man, crazy. Um. Yeah, the number one thing is people want to see how it works. So like if you're selling like a non-aesthetic product or like anything with a slightly different function, just like the big unlock this year, right? We, we've had no drop off in efficiency of Facebook from 2020 till now. Our MER, so like total dollars of revenue divided by total dollars of spend has gone up every single year. And a lot of that is um, we've gotten better at creative, better at ads and really tying those things together. So like. Uh, the creative of what you're trying to sell someone on a TikTok ad or whatever, uh, the offer and the landing page all need to come together in a cohesive like stack. And if you think about like 
you're really trying to win someone's attention. TikTok is the funnest app on earth. You know what I mean? They're like nonstop enjoyment and you're trying to stop somebody and be like, this is worth your time, go to a place. And they have to understand every single step and make it as easy as possible. And uh, most brands don't do that. So like unlocking creative to landing page to offer uh, has been the best thing. And then the, 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 the test that really proved that is if we just show people how it works as soon as possible, they're way more likely to purchase. And that's through like AR kind of thing, like on the, on the checkout page, or not AR, but that's through a video essentially? Yeah, video, or like, you know, like the landing page will have GIFs, or like yeah. we'll have like, you know, the ad, here's a good example. The ad will be like, here's the five reasons why you need this wallet. And they'll see that and they'll click it. So we know they're interested in the reasons why they want it. They go to a landing page and like, here are the five reasons why you, you need this. And there's a gift for each single one of them. Yeah. And then, you know, we'll like give that. them like $15 off or whatever. What's up, Brian? Hey, um, on average, like, what percentage of top flight revenue do you recommend spending on advertising, especially when you're in that 10 to $15 million range? Yeah, so if you're an LVMH or you're a coach, coaches on a company called, called Tapestry or Nike, they spend 5 to 8% of their revenue on marketing. We're not them. I think you should spend 50% of your revenue on marketing. I think a 2x MER is. Uh, at least should make your company default alive. And then that's super aggressive, and you guys are probably looking at me like, that's, that's crazy. Uh, Ridge operates that we can break even at a 1.4. So like part of our success is that I can sell you know, a dollar and 40 worth of wallets for every dollar I give to Meta. You have to build in your margins for that, your cost of goods, whatever. And then if I'm, if I'm hitting a two, I'm taking 10 or 20% of, of profit off that business. And when I hit a three, which is what I've been averaging this year, we're printing money, right? Um, so I would get, figure out a way to get way more aggressive than you think you have to be, because uh, cost of acquisition is not going to go down, right? And I'm gonna give some more advice. If I was doing less than $50 million a year, I would exclusively focus on content creation. And everyone's talking about that, right? But like, here's a tactical reason why. Instagram is going to take away ad space from Reels uh, to promote organic content in Reels because they see TikTok as an existential threat, right? So for the first time since Obama, we can get free distribution from these players. And what they're gonna do is just charge more to offset the revenue. So if really like your first million, your first five million, I, I, I mentored this guy, Isaac, who's a company called uh, Mini Katana. They're gonna do $10 million this year exclusively off of organic content because he sells knives and he can't promote them. So I would just go 100% in on organic content because uh, it's a gift that's only gonna be here for a little bit of time. That's great advice. Yeah, so uh, five years ago, seven years ago, I was at an agency business. Brian worked there too. Uh, and we left to go start our own agency. Ridge was a client, they ended up purchasing us. So when I joined Ridge, when I say it's a family business, it was father, son, best friend. They had three employees, they didn't want to do anything else, right? Uh, so I joined, uh, and we had to spend the next like five years professionalizing that business. So what does it look like now? We have 53 employees. About half of them work in marketing. We, we've always been really marketing heavy. We're just starting to hire people in the product space. So as we launch new categories, what's really important is like, we're gonna launch knives, so I'm going to go find the head of knife design from Benchmade and be like, and I'm gonna offer him $250,000 a year to come design our knife line, right? So, uh, you know, it's, it's very marketing intensive. And then everything else kind of goes on the back burner. Like our ops team, it's like, we use a 3PL. Uh, you know, we have a couple international stores, so it's going to be managing that. We have a small team in China. And then the really unique thing, and if you're a tactical brand doing less than $50 million, what I would take away from this is learn how to use overseas contractors as much as possible. So we have a team of about 100 virtual assistants in the Philippines. So everyone on my team gets a full-time assistant. So my US hires, on average, I pay people, I think my average cost of employees over $100,000 a year. And 
that's expensive per hour. I don't want them checking their own email. I don't want them scheduling their own meetings or whatever. They all get a full-time assistant in the Philippines. And then most of our customer service is done by people in the Philippines. We have one director in the US who oversees them. Uh, and then just moving that sort of rigid structure of like you know, virtual assistants to more parts of the team. That's why we have a really efficient influencer program because I have literally 30 people in the Philippines working on it. So that's why we're able to do a lot of deals. This guy's been waiting. Yeah, yeah. Just, I just want to know the split between Facebook and TikTok. Yeah, so everyone's lying to you about TikTok. Uh, you can't spend that much money. Like, look, I spend, I mean, today I'll spend $50,000 on Facebook and I'll spend three on TikTok. Like, it's the, the distribution isn't really there. The scale isn't really there yet. Uh, but... This is, this is secret hacks, alpha right now. T take care of one thing. Uh, YouTube Shorts, ads platform just launched, crushing it. Like, that's the best place to be spending money on digital ads right now. But we spend money everywhere, man. Like, you know, at least 10% of our money is going to influencers, probably three to 5% is going to TV. We do a lot of stuff with email newsletters, but Google, like, Meta as a building, is probably getting 30 to 40 percent of my money. Thank you. Can you lean in a little bit to that DA for everybody on the team? That is one of the most obvious things that you've had years to have heard in a long time. And how do you, how do you, so like we're, we're very outsourced contracts working in the office. But if I like took a media buyer and dropped the DA under me, and then you know that I dropped the DA under me, can you explain some of how we instruct them to use them? This is what I tell people. If you want to be a manager, you have to manage somebody, right? And everyone in this room has probably fired somebody, right? So most of my team in the US is like 25. They've been with Ridge for two or three years or whatever. And so we want to pay them a lot of money. We want them to move up, right? Like we've only ever had three people quit, right? All three of them went to go start their own companies. So like we want to create that culture. And if you want to be a leader, you got to fucking lead somebody. So it's like, okay. This is your VA. And they're like, well, I don't need one. That's the first thing every employee is going to say. And it's like, no, find work for them to do, right? So if they're a media buyer, what I would tell them is go on Facebook ads library and pull in the top 100 ad concepts. And I want you to go through there and rank them what you think we should do and come up with your ideas or whatever. Because the thing is, this, we're not new to, we're not the first people to hire people in the Philippines. I mean, Walmart's been doing it for, 50 years or whatever, right? So there's a ton of e-commerce talent out there. So like all of our Clavio reporting, right? So like every day I wake up and I can show you my Slack if you wanna see it. There's a report and it's, it's from Rain, who's in the Philippines, and she's like, yep, here's our open rates, here's our sub rates, here's what's going on, and here's what I think we should do. So uh, the, the pushback from your employees being like, I don't need this person, the, it, in two months, they're gonna be like, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Uh, how are you finding your VAs? Is it like Upwork, part one? And two, how are you vetting them? Because like, you know, it can be a pain in the ass to get a bad one, and then you're constantly having to look over their shoulder to see if they're doing it for the first two weeks, which is you know, a long ass time if you're like a new startup. So um, how are you finding people, and how do you vet them? Yeah, so uh, I have a director of remote. He's basically a chief of, chief of staff role in other companies, and his whole job is to make sure that like our culture as a remote company works. So like he builds shit in Notion, and he he vets and hires all the VAs. There's a bunch of companies that specialize in hiring talent in the, v, in, in the Philippines. There's a website called onlinejobs.ph. You can just put job postings up there for free, I think, and then you just get a ton of applicants. And then we do this for every single hire, even our US hires. We offer a paid test. So before you get to speak to me or anyone else in the company, whoever the hiring manager is has to write up a test. And we give, just give it to them. Like, hey, look, we'll give you, in the Philippines, it's like $20. For designers in the US, it's $200. It's like, do this test, prove you can do the work, and then we'll have an interview. And that, that way, you're not getting just bullshitters, right? Like, work speaks for itself. What's up, Brian? How often are you launching new products? I mean, do you do a lot of hype pre-launch, or do you sort of have to be like, hey, it's new and it sort of excites people? Yeah, when I talk about fixing our company structure and professionalizing, uh, 
We launched no products from 2018 to 2020. There was no new product launches, uh, which is not good for a company. <laughs> we're, we're moving now that every month we're trying to launch something, right? So, uh, you know, that can be new colors, right? Uh, it can be, you know, whole new product category. So that's happening in October. Um, but you have to give customers a reason to shop. Like, that's like the big thing, right? Like, if it's, if, it, if it's not new or special, it's not a sales event or whatever, it's like what we found is that just like our ads got boring, right? When we're spending so much fucking money, there's only so many things you could talk about. The pro new product launches and new colors really help that. Um, so we're trying to do at least 20 new products a year. Yeah, so uh, part of professional advising, you know, we, I used to own an agency business. I'm joining this family business selling wallets. And I'm like, how do you guys order these? And they're like, we just emailed this guy in China. And I'm like, oh, fuck, we need someone who speaks Mandarin. So I hired this guy, Leo, who was living in New York. And uh, he's a US citizen, but he's from China. And he went back there to see his family before COVID, and he's been trapped in China for the past like three years. Uh, but you know, it's it's been a huge blessing, right? So I'm like, okay, Leo, just build a team here, right? So, uh, you know, they do QA, they do QC, they make sure to source new factories, they make sure like like our invoices are being paid, and like they, they get new samples. They just deal with the entire like vendor relationship. Uh, we have two sole manufacturers in China, so people who like, essentially consider them like engineering factories. They're not the cheapest, they're actually super expensive, but like, they'll work with you to launch new categories. Like, the key thing, we charge like $95 for it because we invented it. There was like a, a bunch of fucking work had to go into it. Uh, they're a great partner for that. And you know, we even hire like engineering talent in China because uh, there's a lot of people doing great work there. And then we have like one commodity manufacturer. So you can find someone who can make your stuff for way cheaper and they specialize in that. They're like a commodity manufacturer. So you've been with Ridge now coming up in five years and I feel, just, just from your LinkedIn here, and I feel like one of the big themes that we're talking about in this uh, event is how these founders can find ideal executives to, to run their business and take them to the next level. What was, what was Ridge Wallet at before you came on board in terms of like annual revenues? When I met them, they were doing $5 million a year. And how did it come about? How did they find you? How, what was that process like for you joining? Because I, I bet there's a lot of people in the room that would probably like to find an executive like you willing to, able to take their business from five to over 100 million, yeah, right? Yeah, I, I was working at an agency and they were a client. And I said, hey, I'm gonna go start my own agency. You wanna come with? And they said, yes. So I stole them from that agency. They were our biggest client at my agency for, for two years or whatever. Uh, and then, if anyone in here has ever owned an agency business, they're very hard to sell. Like you're not gonna get a big exit out of your agency, right? Maybe, you know, we had three co-founders, the agency was doing maybe $5 million a year in revenue. That's worth maybe $5 million. It's just like you put a lot of effort into it. it's a cash flow business, right? I think that's why the Warren Buffett of Canada or tech or whatever, uh, you know, he cash flowed his agency business into acquisitions because no one wants to buy your agency. It's so relationship based. So Ridge was our biggest client. They made up over half that $5 million or whatever. I was charging them six figures a month. And I was like, look, I'll come in and run your company. You'll get this whole team and it'll just be better for everybody. And they, they didn't want to run it. You know what I mean? Mm. They, there's a reason they only had three employees. It's a long family story there. But uh, so that's how we found each other. My advice for everybody is I think you can... So Ridge bought my agency. I recommend buying an agency. If you find a, a freelancer or an agency or a partner that you really love, uh, the way their business works is they have like two good companies and like eight shitty companies. That's the reality of my agency and basically every agency on earth is like, it's like really the 80-20 rule. Uh, and they should want to align with the best. So if you're using a small agency or freelancer, like you should be like, hey look, how do we make this a permanent relationship? Uh, 
I would then say your company's probably worth a lot less than you think it is, so I'd be a little more generous with, with, with equity. Me and my CMO, Connor, don't have majority control of Ridge, but it's pretty close. Uh, and that's because Ridge understood the value we provided. So at the end of the day, people are gonna drive your business forward. Uh, and maybe your business was worth $50 million eight months ago or whatever. It's probably worth five now. So I would just find a, you know, a good relationship with whoever you hire and really incentivize them to grow it. There's a thing called profits interest if you're in the US where you can lock in your value of your company right now and they can just get incremental equity on top of that. So I recommend doing something like that. That's cool. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, we bought everydaycarry.com. Uh, it's a, you know, it's really an SEO website. You know, they have a big Instagram account, they have a Facebook community, whatever. Um, we, j we worked with them for a long time and they just ran it really poorly and it just made sense for us to, to make an acquisition on it. So how do we use it? Uh, there's a company called Bellroy. They're also Australian. They, they own a company called, I don't fucking remember. Uh, they, they, own, they own like a backpack review website. So like there's already the playbook of doing this. Like you can buy a propaganda arm, you can buy a PR arm, and it just gives us the back door to work with like way more cool brands. So I think the three way, main ways we use it, uh, non-branded search. So if somebody types in best wallet, everydaycarry.com can rank for that organically, and I can also run ads on everydaycarry.com that says we reviewed the best wallets, and they click our page and it says Ridge Wallet's the best wallet. So there's a non-branded search play to it. Uh, the second way we use it is the data piece. They have affiliate information on every single thing people ever buy on that website. Uh, so I know what, what pen is popular in what community. And the third way is it's an advertising business as well. So like Carhartt and G-Shock give them money every month to talk about them. And now I can email G-Shock and be like, hey, we should do something, right? And there's another big wallet company called Secred. They're based in uh, Europe. They sponsor everydaycarry.com. So I, I, I can call the Secred guy whenever I want and be like, let's hang out and talk about wallets or whatever. So buying connections. Do you, is there any effort to So I bought the content business for not a lot of money because the guys running it were just juicing the hell out of it. They, they, like they were just trying to make every single dollar they could. So, you know, I got it for, someone was asking about like the multiples on content businesses. I got it for like one and a half turns of, of seller discretionary cash. Uh, so I'm currently spending like $40,000 a month to grow it. So like we're hiring on-air talent for social media. We're doing way more SEO stuff. And we've just, we've seen those results just compound. You whitelist through it? Uh, yes, we also whitelist through it. And the whole idea is that eventually other brands will want to whitelist through it, right? There's a company called The Quality Edit. I think you interviewed them, yeah. right? So like they're, they're, they're doing that with like the female space really well. So like another men's brand, I, don't, I know the guy Chase from Blenders, he sells sunglasses, just as an example. Uh, they might want to whitelist through our page and then we get the benefit of just additional traffic and whatever else. So. Uh, yeah, it was just opportunistic, so I made, made the buy. It's a great business model. Essentially, it's editorial content about products that they get clients in who pay the ad spend to grow their editorial footprint. So they, they, I think they have 300, 400,000 monthly impressions or whatever that uh, all of their clients are paying a markup for them to deliver, for them to grow. Just really cool. Yeah, it's content arbitrage. It's a great, great little thing. I, we worked with them for years, so like we had a lot of articles and sponsored posts and whatever. So it was a good working relationship. And I wanted to buy a, a men's publication. They knew that, and I, I like I was talking to Cool Material and everybody else. So uh, they they were they were my first bite of that apple. What's the uh, any insights you've driven lately from looking at earnings reports? I know that's uh, that's one of your areas on Twitter. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna keep talking about Hermes because that's like the most recent thing. They, you know, they have a 41% EBITDA margin. You know what I mean? Like, they're growing 20% or whatever, and they have a 40% EBITDA margin. It's like, uh, it just really got me thinking. You know, there's a lot of companies that trade for less than one quarters of revenue. So, Super Dry Japan, uh, Fossil, they make like 
bags and watches or whatever. These companies like, you know, followed a model where we're going to grow quickly, we're going to IPO, and then, you know, this happened to GoPro, this happens to Groupon or whatever. Like as soon as like the founder leaves the business, as soon as the soul leaves the business, and it ends up just being like, you know, a cash cow, they're bleeding slowly over time. It's just a death for a brand. So like, it just, you know, it got me thinking about like, what is the future of the space and actually building a brand, right? Like, how do you build a Yeti? How do you build a Lululemon? And like, there's a reason why, there's a, there's a lot of problems with European businesses. You know what I mean? Like, they're essentially government controlled, like, uh, there's a lot of payola going on, but like there's a reason why legacy brands come from there, and it's because like the family control over a long period of time which lets them think generation like generationally about a business, um, and that's that's really informed my thinking about Ridge, where it's like I think like you know I used to have sales reports on my phone, I like I used to be in every marketing call, I used to be signing every influencer deal. And when you move out of that performance role and you really start thinking like the longevity of this over, I'm not gonna say hundreds of years, but over a decade, really trying to get to a billion dollars, you can't do the VC model because we've, we've seen that not work. So then you have to actually like think incrementally about building something over time. So anyway, that's what I'm thinking about. Just looking, I got a couple of your tweets here. First of all, thanks for coming on the DDC podcast three times. I saw that you wouldn't even go on my first million until they hit a billion downloads. So. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm no, a little it, under a billion. Yeah, until they hit uh, my first billion. Those oh, my first broke for me. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, you've got a good thread here about TikTok versus Reels, about how TikTok is uh, where the content is picked for you versus Reels where it's where it's based on followers and things like that. What elaborate on that? Right. So I think that tweet is from 2021. <laughs> no, this is February 12, 2020. Okay. Oh, yeah. Feb, yeah. Yeah. So like six months ago, or whatever. And really, this like. Uh, the reason why I retweeted that is because I was right. If you read that, it says YouTube Shorts is going to win because YouTube Shorts is going to offer monetization. Uh, so that was just me patting myself on the back that I got that right. Really, I mean, to your original question, uh, the point of, for all of content history, right, like, you know, you were, you were picking your content, who you follow or, like, what you want to see on YouTube or whatever, right, like, what movie you're going to watch on Netflix. Like, you were choosing that, right, and we're moving to, like, algorithmic content where, the almighty algo is serving you what it thinks best for you in the moment, right? Uh, and that's why TikTok is a more enjoyable experience and where, where Reels is behind, right? And like, there's been a lot of like, way smarter people talk about this, that like the reason why you, Reels is, or sorry, TikTok has higher engagement is because it'll show you videos that you're too embarrassed to click on or whatever, uh -huh. right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I don't think TikTok's gonna be around for two years and that Twitter thread is saying that like YouTube is going to offer monetization in a way that TikTok could never compete with, and that was just announced like two days ago. That uh, the so my wife's a TikTok influencer, uh, and you know she she has multiple videos that'll get millions of views or whatever. TikTok will get uh, will get her zero dollars <laughs> for for all those views, where YouTube will you know you can make a living on it, and that's why YouTube's always been the holy grail for influencers to build a network. Um, Sorry, TikTok you don't think will be around in two years? Uh, no, I think it's going to get Snapchat. Like it's going to like whatever happened to Snapchat. No one's survived Meta coming for them and no one survived Meta and YouTube coming for them at the same time. I mean, uh, TikTok's revenue this year is projected to be $10 billion. Ton of money, right? Uh, Meta is going to spend $10 billion on VR research. Like we're talking... In a, in, it's, it's multitudes of differences, right? Where like YouTube paid out $30 billion to creators last year. Like that's what they're paying out to people. So uh, it's just, it's really, really hard to compete at that level of scale. Even though it is by far more fun than any of them so far. Yeah, and then it's just like, can, can they get more fun? The whole, like really the thesis of that is that you need full-time creators to have a platform and if you're not gonna pay your creators, they can't be full-time. Why has YouTube become this monolith or whatever? It's because you can have Mr. B spending millions of dollars on these videos or whatever. Uh, and, you know, TikTok, you have 17 year olds who, uh, you know, th th their best shot at making a living at it is to go to YouTube, which is just like not a good outlet for your, uh, for your platform. I was watching uh, All In Talk the other day, the, the, the VC podcast there, and they were talking about Mr. Beast 
Uh, he was making, uh, the guy was making a prediction that in 10 years, Mr. Beast would overtake McDonald's. His Mr. Beast burgers, would, Beast Burger would take over uh, McDonald's. What do you think of statements like that in terms of creators, the threat to, to, to brands in here of either you know, that need to partner with creators in order to make them a big part of the voice or, or creators starting their, do you see that being like a big trend that, that could uh, you know, disrupt the industry? If I was starting a brand today, I would make sure I built my audience first, right? Linear um, commerce. Yeah, it's, you know, very, you know, someone had very smart advice, I think it was the guy from Outerway Socks, that uh, you shouldn't run ads till you get to a million dollars. And it's, you know, as an influencer, you can get to a million dollars without running ads at all, right? When I talk to influencer businesses, they never run ads, because they're like, no, I'm just gonna put it on my YouTube channel or whatever. So if I was starting a brand today, I would build an audience first, right? You can follow me on Twitter at Sean Ecom, and that's part of me building my audience. Uh, no, but um, the second point of that is, will he overtake McDonald's? And then you have to think, are we living in a oligopoly? Like, are we, are we living in a place where you cannot overtake McDonald's, you can get bought out by McDonald's? And that, it just ends up being like, whatever antitrust does or whatever, because can, can you build $100 trillion commodity businesses, or sorry, $100 billion commodity businesses now? Like, will Mr. Beast open all these locations or whatever? Or is it way more likely they offer him a billion dollar deal and that, you know, a fourth of all McDonald's just offer yeah. Mr. Beast Burger? Or they change the name to Big, ba Big Mac to Big Beast or something. Exactly, something like that. So uh, I think that's a little bit of an over yeah. uh, shoot Bombastic. of what he's saying. But what I will say is, Creator-led businesses are going to win the next five to ten years, and if you guys aren't thinking about being a creator, like it just it's a, it's a gift from God, fucking free distribution, like customer affinity, all those things that like you know outdoor voices said they had, turns out they did it, right? But now we have for the first time people actually do have this, right? Peter McKinnon is a photographer. I think he's actually also Canadian. A lot of Canadian love lately. Uh, he did a bag line with Nomadic, and that saved their entire business. I know some numbers from Nomadic, but like they were going to go out of business, so like let's do this Peter McKinnon bag line, and it pumped ten million dollars worth of capital in their business. So, uh, yeah, for sure, that's going to be the future. Any uh, final question here for uh, a chief wallet salesman? <laughs> Nice. Uh, you got so if you're not already, he mentioned it, but follow Sean at Sean Ecom for continued hot takes on Twitter, and uh, look forward to continuing to catch up with you, man. S E A N. The only acceptable Sean spelling. No. I'm sorry. All right. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Hopefully it was good. <laughs>Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you're not a subscriber to our newsletter, you can do that right now at directtoconsumer, all one word, dot co. I'm Eric Dick, and this has been the D2C Podcast. We'll see you next time.